The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. This week on Q&A, Tom Goldstein, co-founder and publisher of the website SCOTUS Blog, discusses his education, his law firm, and his website, which was recently recognized with a 2013 Peabody Award for Outstanding Achievement in Electronic Media. Tom Goldstein, can you remember when you named SCOTUS Blog and why? I think it was the very first day when we imagined, hey, what if we create a website? My wife, Amy, and I, who's the editor, and we just used the initials. Supreme Court of the United States, there was this thing called blogging. We called it SCOTUS blog. Not much more thought went into it than that, and it's been with us for 10 years now. Why is what you're doing necessary? Well, it's amazing. The Supreme Court is a really important institution. Everybody's got to agree with that, from Bush versus Gore to the health care decision to affirmative action to same-sex marriage. And yet, with all of the coverage of Congress and the president, there was no place that was paying complete attention to what the justices were doing. There was just a gap. It was just an opportunity. Why do you think there's so little interest on the part of the general media in the Supreme Court? Well, I think that it's not a very sexy place. Every once in a while, it does something incredibly interesting, and the TV trucks race over. And there is a core press corps, and you know the major newspapers pay a lot of attention to it. C-SPAN does significant oral arguments. But it's so complicated when it comes to a lot of the technical legal issues, and some of them are so dull, to be honest, that it's very hard for the public to engage and stay focused on that place. Unlike Congress and the President, for example, are always doing something that's important and interesting and accessible. You uh, applied to how many law schools in the beginning? I guess about, it's a, it's a sad time to remember, a uh, half dozen or so. What happened? They thought it would be better if I pursued other opportunities, um, but uh, I had my stepmother's maybe second cousin or so was an adjunct faculty member at American University's law school here in Washington and went to the faculty head of admissions and said, my cousin, Tommy Goldstein, you know, is my favorite cousin. I, yeah, I think he'd just be fantastic. You, you know, and if we had met, I'm sure that that would have, he would have believed that. But it was just, you know, family doing uh, something good for family, and they let me in, and I had the most unbelievable experience. I got really lucky. I had just been kind of that stereotypical college student who enjoys life more than they enjoy school. You say you've been in this business for 10 years of SCOTUS blog, but you've also been an advocate for cases in front of the Supreme Court. How many? Uh, 28. So I basically decided, I, when I was in law school, I got to be Nina Totenberg's intern and fell in love with the Supreme Court. Had no idea that I would in the way that I did. Um, when I was a fourth year lawyer, I graduated, I guess, in 95, in 1999, I just quit my job and said, I'm going to be a Supreme Court advocate and uh, opened up a law firm in my house. Um, and since then, that's really all that I've done for about 15 years. Was it really in the laundry room? Uh, it was uh, in what, it was in the third bedroom. There was no laundry room. It was a tiny house. Um, and it, it became the laundry room. Uh, and we had the law firm, Amy joined me in the firm, and we had the law firm for, uh, in the house probably about seven or eight years. Now we have actual office space, so it's a big uh, upgrade for us. So you say that it, the whole SCOTUS blog thing was a marketing ploy. Yeah, yeah. So nobody was covering the Supreme Court on the internet and saying, we're the site that you should go to. At the same time, I had this law practice with Amy, and we'd been doing it for a few years, and so I had the brilliant insight that said, look, if we cover the Supreme Court on the internet, people who are looking for a lawyer in the Supreme Court will say, gosh, these people must really know what they're talking about. It had, you know, I thought it would be a little bit of a public service, but mostly I think in those terms, kind of business development terms. Turns out that was a really stupid idea, and nobody does that. Um, people who need ser serious Supreme Court counsel don't go 
get me the guy with the website. They want to talk about experience and how you've done and what you know about the court uh, as a lawyer. So that didn't work out. But after about three years, we hired a real reporter, Lyle Denniston, who's been covering the court for more than 50 years, has genuine experience. And we changed the mission completely, and that is we don't write about our cases at all, and we're not allowed to talk about our own cases. We said we're just turning this over to the public, and very much on the ideal of something like C-SPAN. Uh, it's not intended to promote us in any way. It's intended to be a public good. So when did that switch? That happened about seven years ago. And interestingly and happily ironically, the effect of it has been that we're much more respected now, now that we're not talking about our own stuff. People trust us to objectively describe the cases, to not be engaging in self-promotion, to just being out there to give them the straight scoop and access to the briefs and you know what all the cases are. And uh, I think people have really appreciated it. The general public, yeah. people watching tonight <clears throat> who are not experts in the court, yeah. not lawyers, what's in it for them on SCOTUS blog? Well, we're really focused on them much more than we ever have been. Honestly, we started as a site for lawyers, pretty much, and that is we talked in the way that we talk as attorneys who practice in front of the Supreme Court. And over the past three or four years, we've come to understand that it's actually the lawyers who can already best access what's going on at the court and understanding it. But there are 300 million other people in the country who are affect, affected by the justices' decisions, and we should be focusing on them. So Amy, for example, writes a entire feature called In Plain English. Lyle Denniston always has a plain English summary of all of the cases. Uh, we have on the big cases a discussion of this case made simple. And so we really, really want, and this is the best example of how it has nothing to do with business development. There's nothing in it for us in any way, shape, or form. We just are trying to put these technical legal concepts that have a big effect on people. Say, can the government track you using a GPS device without a warrant? Can you patent genes, including the gene that will let uh, a test be made to tell whether you are susceptible to breast cancer? Those things have very tangible consequences for people in the context, however, of a very technical legal case. And we want to just try and bring it down into language that everybody can understand. I'm going to show some video in a moment, but before we do that, <clears throat> something put you on the map mm. last year, something yes. called Obamacare. Yes. <clears throat> How did that happen? Well, uh, of course, the Supreme Court was considering the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, and at the end of the term, what we realized is there was going to be unbelievable interest in the case. And so usually Lyle is at the Supreme Court on the phone with us describing the case. And we thought, gosh, that's not going to get the job done here. Very complicated, huge interest. So we took seven people, set up nine different internet connections down at the court. Uh, we, as a combined group of us, had argued over 30 Supreme Court cases. And it turned out that at one time we had uh, almost a million people on the website at once. So the interest in what was going on in the case was so high. Well, this will set it up a little bit on how the confusion came about with some of the other networks. Let's watch this. From Talking Points Memo, we pulled this. Oh boy. We have breaking news here on the Fox News Channel. Hold Leaking on a second, fashion. hold on a second. Kate Baldwin has got some information. Kate, go ahead, tell us what's going on. This is our first reading. We're still going through the reading, uh, the, the, uh, the opinion, but I want to bring you the breaking news that according to producer Bill Mears, the individual mandate is not a valid, of, not a valid exercise of the Commerce Clause. So it appears as if the Supreme Court justices have struck down the individual mandate, the centerpiece of the health care legislation. The individual mandate has been ruled unconstitutional. I'm going to hop back on this phone to try to get more information for you and bring it right to you, Wolf. We're still trying to figure this out. Be cautious with us. We are trying to do the best we can right now as we sort through it. And we need it to update take, our lower third, right, which it, may not be correct right now. It may take several minutes. This is a very confusing, very large opinion. Uh, excuse me, uh, Kate Baldwin is getting some more details. What else are you learning, Kate? As we're reading through this again, uh, we are reading now that the entire law has been upheld, Wolf. Why is there such a need to be first? There isn't such a need to be first. In a case like this one, everybody knew the day the case was coming down. 
everybody knew that the law wouldn't take effect for two more years. There's just, it was a kind of unfortunate competition, a, a desire to be first. Uh, and I think hopefully some lessons have been learned about that. We actually, you know, I had the opinion, I actually had a conference call that had on it almost all of the networks and newspapers and the White House. And I told them, look, I'm just going to put this on mute. You're just going to have to wait because it was much more important to get it right than be first. And, and we're talking about the difference between literally one m minute more. Um, so I think, in, and a lot of money was made and lost because of some networks having it wrong and the wire services having it right. So I hope that we've come to understand that, you know, take a breath, especially when it's super complicated in the way the healthcare decision was, where there were a lot of different legal issues, and tell people accurately, because otherwise what we've had really is a crisis of confidence in some of the networks and in some of the press generally. You don't get, you know, to take it back, and people don't really understand that this was an honest and fair mistake. They just think you're not reliable. So what did you do differently? Mm -hmm. Well. Uh, I said, look, I'm going to take personal responsibility for this. If we're going to put something on the website saying what's happened in the case, I'm going to do it myself after consulting with my colleagues and either I'll be right or I'll be wrong. And when I figured out what had happened, I nonetheless went through a second time to make sure that I, had, that I was right and there wasn't some nuance that I was missing. And so I think the things that we did differently were we were patient. We weren't trying to be absolutely first. Um, we double-check things, and we had experts, right? The, the reporters involved had worked very hard on the case. The, the CNN team, the Fox team, other teams had done dozens, if not hundreds, of interviews about the case. They were actually very knowledgeable. But nonetheless, their general interest press, rather than people who'd been deeply involved in the legal questions. And so we had just a natural advantage, I guess. We've got some very old video of Lyle Denniston. Yes. At the time, he was with the Baltimore Sun. Uh, he's probably in his early 50s there. He's now 81 years wow, old, wow. still working. And does he work every day for you? It's unbelievable. Not only does he work every day, he works 14 hours a day. He works through the weekend. It's Amy, who's the editor and reviews every piece, you know, is editing stuff of his Saturday, Sunday. I've never seen him. He's a machine. And the interesting thing is you have somebody who's 81 years old who, when he started working with us, would have typed up sheets about the cases, but has embraced the internet and the technology in a way that's unimaginable. It's fantastic. Here he is in 1985. Um, the uh, uh, reporters will show up in greater numbers on the days when the Supreme Court issues decisions and orders. I take it that that was a teleprinter in, the, yeah, that's in the UPI's uh, uh, quarters there. Um, the, uh, that's the Associated Press re uh, reporters' uh, digs and their computer, their video display terminal, um, and decorated with the artifacts of the reporters' individual experience, obviously. But most of the reporters uh, will show up at the court on the days when the court has opinions and orders. And uh, this is the workspace that you're looking at now where uh, we actually uh, sit at typewriters or use our telephones. Um, it's in an adjoining room that uh, we will receive our opinions on the days when they're released. And uh, mostly that isn't a very heavy activity until about May or June. The court hears arguments beginning in October, but doesn't really get busy with issuing final decisions until the springtime. Interesting thing is I don't think anybody on the court is still there back in 85. Yeah, it has changed a lot. Once John Paul Stevens left the court, uh, there was a big generational turnover. What's the, the controversy over, and I understand it's changed, getting Lyle Dennison credentials at yes. the Supreme Court? Well, for a long time, the, well, a couple of things. The Supreme Court, unlike other governmental institutions, doesn't issue its own press pr passes. It has a press office, but it's a small body, and they don't really have, I think, the time to go through and deal with all of these requests. So they use the Senate. If you have a Senate press pass, then you can get a Supreme Court press pass generally. And I think the Senate, like a lot of different places, is struggling with what to do with new media. You know, when is a blog a real part of the media? We're a special puzzle because we're practicing lawyers as well. 
Uh, and so after we had requested several times, uh, they, uh, a couple of weeks ago, for the first time, issued a suppress pass. And so we are in line, I think, to get a Supreme Court credential for the first time, which is, I think, a good thing. Once we've been covering the court for 10 years, we have, you know, the biggest, op objectively, the biggest op uh, effort to cover the Supreme Court ever. Um, it's nice that it's a it's a nice recognition that they'll treat us as a member of the press. Now people love to write about your uh, other things that you do in your life, and I'll bring it up so that people think you're sitting oddly. You've just come back from a, a difficult time in uh, Mexico. Uh, I did. I. Um uh, had the good chance to go skiing out in Utah. The problem is that I'm a terrible skier, so I hurt my knee and then went uh, on spring break with our wonderful two daughters, Amy and I, uh, who are married. Uh, we went down there and because my le knee and leg were very stable, I had deep vein thrombosis. I had blood clots in my leg and then one of the blood clots thought it would be more interesting to go live in my lungs, so I had a pulmonary embolism and I was in the ICU there and eventually we got me an air ambulance back to the United States, but I am on the mend and going to be fine, but it has been an adventure for the past month or so. What's this business about you and the Ferrari and the races in Las Vegas? <laughs> I uh, went through a time when, rather than focusing on being a Supreme Court litigator, it seemed like maybe it would be fun to do some other things, and so I did uh, have a, a little bit of a race car and uh, did some drag racing out of the, out there. Always good to mix things up. It's not really what people who do what I do, Supreme Court litigators, tend uh, to do. They tend to be unbelievably accomplished, super smart, but relatively staid people, and that is not what people generally would say about me, either the super smart or the staid. You mentioned that you went to American University yes. here in Washington and got your law degree there yes. at night. I actually didn't go at night. Oh, you did not? I was originally admitted into the evening program, that's true, uh, but like a day before school started, a seat opened up in the day program. But people often write about the fact that uh, the Supreme Court justices go to Harvard, Yale, and Stanford. That's right. There are six Catholics and three Jews. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a narrow group in some it respects. It really is. But, it may be unfortunately so. But, but is it... Is it possible that you're not accepted, or you weren't in the beginning because you weren't from one of those big schools? Sure. Well, and, and I didn't clerk at the Supreme Court, and I didn't work in the Solicitor General's office. I think there is, look, the there is a felt sense in almost any group that this is what people who do this look like. And so I hadn't gone to those schools, although I loved my school dearly and felt incredibly fortunate to, to go there. It's a fantastic place. Um, I didn't work in the jobs that everybody else who does this did. Uh, and the other thing is that I made a practice very early on of going after cases to say, look, you know, you're a fourth year lawyer, you didn't clerk at the Supreme Court, people aren't going to exactly knock the door down to ask you to handle their Supreme Court case. That's just not going to happen. If I was going to get involved in this practice and build a law practice and have those opportunities, I was going to have to go out and find them. And at the time, in the late 90s, that was totally unheard of. It was, again, it's a very staid institution. Things don't change very much. People are extremely reserved. And that's benefited the court tremendously, and I respect that. Uh, but when you, people are used to, if you've gone to Harvard and Yale and Stanford, clerked at the Supreme Court, worked in the Solicitor General's office, then cases are going to come to you. And they were not used to somebody who was going out and chasing down business. So how did you, in the beginning, cold call? Yes. Explain that. Well, what I did is I realized that because the practice was so staid, that people weren't finding opportunities. And the Supreme Court's practice of taking cases, so there are really two stages of Supreme Court litigation. The first is you have to ask the justices to hear your case, and then they hear it. And they hear about 80 cases a year. But the practice of asking them, there's actually pretty much a formula for which cases they will take. They involve disagreements between courts of appeals around the country. And so I can read a decision of a court of appeals and tell you pretty accurately, yeah, this is something that might well interest the Supreme Court. And so I found bunches and bunches of cases where if the party that lost only asked the Supreme Court to hear it, 
they probably would. And so I went to the lawyers in those cases and said, look, I can help you get in the door. And the first work that I did at the Supreme Court, I did basically for free. I argued my first eight cases at the Supreme Court over the course of, I think, three years. And I was paid a total of $8,000 to do all of that legal work over three years. And, but that's how I got my foot in the door. Why would you do that? Well, it was the only way to get from there to here. There was no, uh, nobody would take a young lawyer with the level of experience and knowledge that I had and say, I want to give you a big, important commercial Supreme Court case. I needed to learn more about what I was doing, show that I was capable of doing it. Uh, and over those course of those three years, I we started the blog after not that long, probably about year three or four. And also, I had the idea of I, I had kind of cornered by then the work on free Supreme Court litigation. It turns out, however, that free Supreme Court litigation will not pay the mortgage. And so I had to move to doing some paying work, but I had all of the free work and I thought, how am I going to get this done? And I started with some colleagues, uh, Supreme Court clinics at Stanford and Harvard. And I actually ended up getting that credential in that way. So I, for a long time, taught at both of the law schools. I thought it was interesting that you do teach, or you teach at Harvard and I at, at Stanford. I, I just <laughs> stopped teaching at Stanford. I did that for 10 years and now just teach the Harvard. So program. why would Stanford and Harvard accept you in af with, you know, not the pedigree that they're used yeah. to? Well, I think that those places, they, in terms of the people who teach there, it's true that a lot of their professors are their own graduates, but they're really looking for people with a certain kind of experience, particularly when it comes to the, the lecturers, the visiting people, as opposed to full-time tenured faculty. And I had shown over the course of those three or four years that I could build up this Supreme Court practice and give the students the opportunity to work on them. The, the novel thing about the, case, the classes is that the students work on actual Supreme Court cases. It's not a theoretical class. It's, they're not uh, just practice. They are really working for clients. And what I had decided based on my own experience was that, look, if I can do this, it doesn't actually take a rocket science to, ro scientist to do it. I can involve the students, and I think the law schools appreciated that and the students liked it a lot. Go back for a moment to the $8,000 over eight cases. Who did you represent? I represented uh, all kinds of people, criminal defendants, individual lawyers, the city of Los Angeles. The Supreme Court, because they decide so few cases, really is catch as catch can. You're not, beggars cannot be choosers when it comes to arguing Supreme Court cases. Because if you sit back and say, well, look, you know, I do patent cases for the defendant, there's going to be one of those cases every year, maybe, or two or three at most. And you can't really afford to be that picky and that kind of specialist. What I'm a specialist is in that institution. I think I understand those people, which isn't, again, isn't unbelievably complicated or novel or special. If you, if you paid attention to one place, one group of people for 15 years, you ought to know it pretty well. What's the first thing you tell somebody that has to appear before the Supreme Court? It takes a lot of effort. You have to largely throw out everything that you did in the lower courts and start again because their expectations are so incredibly high for the level of research and thinking and writing. What do you tell people about Chief Justice John Roberts? Uh, he knows the court maybe better than anybody. He has lived his entire life there. He was a law clerk to Chief Justice Rehnquist. He worked in the Solicitor General's office. He was by far the most respected private uh, lawyer when he was here in Washington uh, representing people at the Supreme Court and now he's the Chief Justice and he cares about the institution so when people talk about the health care vote and whatever happened there is you know a, a secret matter inside the court one thing is he you know would have voted the way he thought the law should be decided and he cares about the country's respect for the institution but he didn't like what you were doing in the beginning it's true remember when uh, I said that people were not used to uh, people going after cases. And he was someone who was, as I said, the most respected advocate of his generation. And I think that for him and for a lot of people, the notion that somebody was chasing work was, you know, not uh, the way it should be done. I, I don't know that he felt at all strongly about it, but uh, I think that, I mean, he was quoted one time saying that. We need to introduce the audience to your wife, yeah. because a schedule problem couldn't have her here with us today. Amy Howe, you've yes. been married how long? We have been married for, uh, you know, going on 
17, 18 years. And the original law firm? Is actually Goldstein and Howe. Is it still Goldstein It is not Howe? because Amy is not practicing law. She's working on the blog. This is part of the transition for us of being able to show the blog isn't you know, something that is intended to, you know, give advantage to the law firm practice. Where did she go to school? She went to Georgetown here in D.C. And how old are your kids? Our kids are 10 and 6. Here she is on the Washington Journal. The justices vote. They go around the room and they, and they talk about their position on the issue. And the first justice to go is always the chief justice. But then the next justice, it, the, the most senior justice, is Justice John Paul Stevens. So he gets to sort of put out the liberal view right away. And if he is in the, uh, in the majority and Justice the Chief Justice Roberts is on the other side, which is not infrequent in the, the hotly contested cases at the court, he gets to assign that opinion. And so he can either assign that to opinion, opinion to himself, as he's done in some high-profile cases like the detainee cases, or he can assign it to one of the swing justices, like Justice Anthony Kennedy, for example, as he did in Lawrence versus Texas, um, to make sure that we, he keeps that swing justice in the majority and the, that swing justice doesn't switch over to the other side. When you think about those early days, you were operating out of your third bedroom, now a laundry room in your house, uh, and Amy Howe. What, what other things do you remember about the struggles getting started? Well, it was a totally different world. We really, we, you know, we were a young couple. We, uh, the blog's 10 years matches up with the birth of our first child, Nina, named after Nina Totenberg, who we both interned for. Uh, and getting to know this town, getting to know the practice, getting accepted, it was an extremely exciting but uncertain time. It's like for anybody who's starting a family and starting a business, and we were starting a couple of them. And then you layer on top of that this thing, the internet, back in the day, this notion of blogs was just starting. And we were out there kind of casting about without a roadmap, I'd say. Nina Totenberg has been covering the court for 30 years? She's only 35 years old, so, but yes. She's For a National country. Public Radio. Yes. Uh, what did you learn from her being an intern? Everything. Um, she really exposed me to everything about the institution. The nice thing about that job is you just get to go everywhere with her. You go to the court, you go with her to interviews, you go with her to meet senators and representatives. And she gave me a, a kind of a real genuine feel for the institution and then taught me the basics. She knows everything, but I, you know, at that point I was only able to absorb the basics of what it is to be a good reporter, which has you know, really led to the blog. We, without that experience, I grew up inside the press corps rather than inside the group of lawyers who practice. So I interned for her twice and I got to know all the members of the press and they taught me so much about how it is that you explain something like the Supreme Court. But you say that cable television people don't have any problem talking about what you do, but the print press won't promote you. Well, I mean, I think that the print press has a harder time knowing what to do with us as we get more prominent. There are some parts of the print press, say the New York Times, that's incredibly confident in its own position, doesn't mind citing us at all. And there are other places that I think are worry about uh, inciting us, are they actually promoting a competitor? You know, the Washington Post doesn't go out of its way to say, oh, the New York Times says, and we're not of the stature of the New York Times, but I, I think we're a puzzle on a lot of different levels. On the other hand, we try very hard to promote all of the traditional press. We have a roundup of everything they're doing on Twitter, which we're very involved with, we try hard. So everybody's feeling their way forward. I read in the piece in the Atlantic on you, he wears the same dark suits they do, meaning the people from Stanford, Harvard, and other places, and is deceptively bland, looking physically slight with slender fingers and thinning hair. I think we've gone well past thinning. But the reason I read that is because you also um, put our chain a little bit on some of your YouTube stuff. I want to show... <laughs> Uh, a couple of your YouTube moments where you are, I don't know, what are you using? Is it this the Tom Goldstein humor? I, I suppose it's what passes for it. Let's, let's watch. Have you been the victim of gross racial discrimination? Or otherwise, the oppressed victim of an outrageous lower court ruling? Well, then taking your case to the Supreme Court is your constitutional right, and I can help. You see, I'm a member of the Supreme Court Bar. That's the select group of attorneys permitted by law to practice before the justices, filing briefs, and actually presenting oral argument. These books, 
include the briefs in all the cases I filed in the court over more than 10 years of practice. In that time, I've argued 18 cases on a wide range of important federal law questions. I teach Supreme Court litigation at Stanford Law School in California, as well as Harvard Law School in Massachusetts. I've been called, quote, the nation's premier Supreme Court advocate. I speak regularly at the nation's most prestigious law schools. I even hobnob with the justices themselves. And I've been named one of the 100 most influential lawyers in America. Uh, now, the people in the legal business just can't like that. <laughs> I don't know, and I don't really care. Uh, well, look, I now, where did you do that? I did that in my office at uh, the law firm. And um, look, I, I think that people who do a lot of serious things in this town take themselves way too seriously. I don't think that I walk on water. I really enjoy what I do. I feel it's a privilege. And I don't mind making light of what it is that I and other people who have this job do. I think that we're lawyers, we represent people, uh, we're not the greatest thing since sliced bread, and if we can't really have fun with it, then what's the point? What was your role in Bush v. Gore? Uh, I probably am responsible only for losing one vote, so don't blame me for the whole thing. I represented the vice president. I um, had the great opportunity to work for Lawrence Tribe, the very famous Harvard Law School professor who was working deeply in the case, and also had worked for David Boies, who ended up arguing Bush versus Gore, so I second chaired the case. And I guess I probably I managed it along with Amy for the vice president. So I wasn't in charge of the legal thinking, but I was in charge of a lot of the logistics. It was an unbelievable experience. What is your one and lost record? Uh, 15 and 13. 15 won? Yes. 13 lost? Yes. Were those early eight cases lost? No, they were split pretty evenly. You know, there are cases that, you know, there are cases that are nine nothing one way or the other. So I have one nine nothing cases, and your clients often think, oh, you're the greatest lawyer ever. It basically means that, it, you know, my six year old could have won the case, and I've lost my share of nine zero cases. The ones that you really sweat are the ones that are five to four, and that's been a smaller group. They're probably, I don't know the exact number, I don't really pay attention. Uh, probably about seven or eight of those. A lot of justices suggest that the oral arguments make a difference. What do you think? I think it depends on what we're talking about. So if you say, how often does a justice change their mind because of the oral argument? Probably not terribly infrequently. But for it to make a difference in the outcome, it has to be a justice who is in a group of five switching over to a group that was four. And I don't think that happens that often. But the oral argument can make a big difference in how they decide the case, how they write the opinion, how broad or narrow the rule is. Because by the time they get to oral argument, they've thought a ton about the case. They've met with their staff. But they haven't gotten maybe into the level of thinking about how they would write an opinion with their colleagues who they haven't actually talked to before the oral argument. Here's another one of your YouTube, uh -oh. still on YouTube, okay. these things. Here's yeah. Tom Goldstein. More recently, Washington has been abuzz with the historic confirmation of Justice Sonia Sotomayor, from which we all learned so much. As was widely noted, I correctly predicted Justice Sotomayor's nom nomination and confirmation on SCOTUS block. Now, to be sure, I had also predicted that President Obama would nominate other candidates, from Solicitor General Elena Kagan to Seventh Circuit Judge Diane Wood to a small flightless bird from Kansas, but thankfully nobody remembers those posts. Now, I'm not saying that I deserve all of the credit for Justice Sonia Sotomayor's nomination and confirmation, but my role in the process did in fact lead GQ magazine to name me one of the 50 most powerful people in Washington, D.C. And that matters because no publication is so devoted to the comprehensive coverage of the intersection between politics and power in America as GQ magazine. Where did you develop your sense of humor? Uh, well, let's say it's a work in progress, but I think it is a little bit as a result of really liking to, like, I like to talk in front of people. And if you're really staid and boring and tired, then uh, you're not going to have a good experience. I also, my big thing as a high school and college student was debate. And so public speech has been part of my favorite, you know, part of, part of what I enjoy the most. Where did you grow up? I grew up in a lot of places on the East Coast. I was born in New Jersey, in Princeton, lived uh, wherever around New Jersey there's a Rutgers campus, because my mom and dad uh, moved around there. My folks uh, moved to South Carolina and then split up, and so I lived in a variety of places in South Carolina and Florida, and so 
uh, I'm an East Coaster, but you can't really pin me down. What do, you, do your parents do, or are they doing? They are a doctor and a lawyer, a doctor in South Carolina. My dad helped me get through uh, the pulmonary embolism uh, by phone, and then my mom is a lawyer in New York. Where did she get her law degree? She got her law degree from Rutgers, although she spent a year in Columbia at the University of South Carolina. So when did you know you wanted to be a lawyer? Uh, in utero, I think. I just can't imagine a time when I didn't think I wanted to be a lawyer from being a kid really, really early on, although not doing this. I was, a, you know, a lot of people think of themselves who are going to be lawyers as trial lawyers, the Perry Mason type stuff, and that's really what I thought I would be, and it was only with the internship at Nina that I just went off to the side. Go back to that you said you couldn't get into law schools, uh, whatever, 20 years ago, and that your mother's aunt or your mother's cousin or yeah, whatever it was exactly. helped you. Uh, how often how often is that possible? It's Well, you have to have the good fortune to know the right people. But the amazing thing is, you know, there are a lot of people with a lot of resumes in the world that look the same. And one of the things that I've come to recognize is that so much is personal relationships. The ties that you build to other people, the friends that you have, the colleagues that you've had, that, that they will go to bat for you and vouch for you makes all the difference in the world. And I just got lucky. I want to show you some video that we did you may have even seen this with Justice Breyer when mm. he took us around his office yeah. and see what you can add to this because this is in his office in the Supreme Court yeah. kind of explaining the paper trail yes. on cases. Here's Justice Breyer. Of those 80,000 cases, 8,000 ask us each year to hear the case. That means about 150 a week. 150 what? 150 requests to hear the case. Well, here they are for this week, right here. For this a, week? Yeah, for this week. This week. So what we do is read through these, and we all read all of them. I'm going to qualify this in a minute. But we all look at all of them, and then we vote. We meet at conference and we vote. And if there are four of the nine of us who want to hear any of these cases, we'll hear it. Now, you might wonder, how could I read all these in one week? Somebody might wonder that. And I'd like to say, oh, because I'm so clever, but that isn't the reason. What we do with these, in fact, since it would be impossible for one person to read all these every single week, is one of the things these wonderful law clerks do is we have a, we have a pool for most of us, and they'll we'll pool our four clerks and say there are about 30 clerks, and those 30 clerks will divide these and the clerks will read five or six. 30 into 150 or so is about five or six. Well, they can do that, and moreover, they can do it very thoroughly. So if I were just to skim through this, maybe I would think this petition, see, look, here's somebody writing here. It's sort of, he's a little, maybe he's a little scrawled. I don't know. I might, maybe he's right. Now, if I had to read 150, I wouldn't necessarily find that. But they, by reading five or six, are going to find out whether there is a case that we should hear. You said earlier that you've been in front of that court 28 times? Yeah. What do you know about the court that when you write the petitions, uh, either petition for certiorari or uh, even the briefs, yeah. what do you know about putting that language on there that will make a difference for somebody like Justice Breyer? A lot. I mean. I'm not competent to do a lot of things. You wouldn't want me to do a deposition, you know, where you ask questions. You wouldn't want me to stand up maybe in front of a trial judge and do a trial and everything. But like I said, if I've been doing one thing for 15 years, I got nine people to know what it is that they're looking for and they're thinking about. I spend day and night doing it. We got the website, we've got the law school classes. And so I really understand that. That's the value that somebody like me doesn't have to be me. Somebody like me adds. It doesn't mean that if you're coming to the Supreme Court, you need a Supreme Court lawyer to argue your case. But if, if you're talking to anyone, what you really want, and you're trying to persuade them of something, as you are with the justices, you want somebody who knows that person really, really, really well. And that's the role of a person like me. So what do you know about Antonin Scalia? Well, I know a ton about his jurisprudence, what he thinks about probably every provision of the Constitution that he's written about, his view about administrative agencies, different statutes, the things that he finds most persuasive about interpreting laws and regulations and provisions of the Constitution, and that he's a way more complicated person than people think. People think, oh, he's super conservative. Well, 
he's an incredibly principled guy, first and foremost, and so a lot of his constitutional rulings actually favor criminal defendants because he reads some critical provisions of the Constitution about your right to a jury trial, for example, your right to confront witnesses against you in a very broad way that's very favorable to the accused. What about Justice Breyer? Well, I just thought that was beautiful because Justice Breyer, who, by the way, is, and as many people will know, is recovering from a, another serious biking accident, having soldier, shoulder replacement surgery, which sounds awful. Uh, he really loves to explain. He started, not started, but he has been a law professor for a long time. And he really cares that people understand the law in its fullest, and so he's been writing books about the law and the Constitution now. And his perspective from just is kind of, in some respects, the opposite of Justice Scalia, where Justice Scalia is very rule-bound, a very clear sense of a, a particular way to read the Constitution. Justice Breyer is the consummate pragmatist. He wants the system to work, and so he will take different w uh, pieces of the puzzle of how to interpret a provision of the Constitution to try and assemble something that he thinks doesn't make nonsense of the law. I know you have opinions on this, so let's let Justice Scalia talk about it first and then we'll come back to you on television in the court. Yes. But if you know what our real business is, if you know that we're not usually contemplating our navel, should there be a right to this or that, should there be a right to abortion, should there be a right to homos, that's not usually what we're doing. We're usually dealing with the Internal Revenue Code, with ERISA, which all, with, with patent law, with all sorts of dull stuff that only a lawyer could uh, could understand uh, and, and perhaps get interested in. If the American people saw all of that, they would be educated. But they wouldn't see all of that. But you, we get your, your outfit would carry it yeah, all, but we get to, to be sure. But what most of the American people would see would be 30-second, 15-second takeouts from our argument, and those takeouts would not be characteristic of what we do. They would be uncharacteristic. Yeah, now but what we see is an article in a newspaper that's out of context with what you say is... Uh, that's fine, but it's... it's, it's you, people read that and they say, well, it's an art article in a newspaper, and the guy may be lying or he may be misinformed. But somehow when you see it live, a a an excerpt pulled out of an entire... When you see it live, it has a much greater impact. Is he right? This is where I always get myself in trouble. No, he's not. And it's an uncomfortable place for somebody who practices in front of the court to say the justices have it wrong. They've thought a ton about this, let's be clear. And there is a broad agreement among the justices who are people who care about free speech and the First Amendment and the public that they shouldn't televise things. I think that the experience of other courts in the United States and other countries is directly to the contrary. And I just agree with what he started with, which is, if people saw their Supreme Court on C-SPAN, if they saw it on the internet, they would respect it more, not less. The justices treasure and value, and they do their, better jo their jobs better when they are largely anonymous. Now, they don't stay entirely anonymous. Some of them want to sell books, for example. And so that's a valuable part of it. But it is so hard to get to see the Supreme Court when there are 100 to 150 public seats. So a few thousand people can see it every year, and it's a big, big country. It's super expensive to come to Washington, D.C. And so I think people would understand and appreciate and admire the Supreme Court more. And even if they didn't, it's the country's right. Those are public proceedings, in my opinion. The American public deserves to get to see the institution in operation. The last several justices, when they're at their confirmation hearings, have suggested they're in favor of television, yeah. as you know. Yes. Then all of a sudden we hear, <clears throat> no, not a good idea. Well, the I think there are a couple things going on. The first is once you get inside the institution, you better understand why it is that they've been resistant to it. And so I think that the, the new justices have probably moved some. But second, you just have to understand that the justices really prefer to operate by consensus. And so until there really is a solid majority for change, I would be very surprised if any justice came out and said, I think that there should be cameras because of the conflict and controversy that it would create. They think about the issue a lot. They continue to talk about it. They continue to learn from the experience of other courts. Uh, I think it's just going to take another generation. And it will change, and they will eventually televise it. I think it's regrettable that they haven't done it yet. Peter Irons gets credit for breaking this logjam on the, the audio. Yeah. Here he is testifying back in 2005 in yeah. front of Arlen Specter. Now, until 1986, there was no restriction on access to those tapes. But in 1986, when Fred Graham of CBS News obtained a copy of the 
Pentagon Papers oral argument and played excerpts of it on television and radio, Chief Justice Berger imposed restrictions on access to those tapes, limiting it to what were termed private research and teaching. And I had decided in 1991, having heard some of these tapes when I was in law school, um, that it would be a good educational project to make them available to the public, particularly for use in schools. So we now have audio the same week. <clears throat> yeah, so this is essentially the court's compromise because it has listened to the public an interest in hearing what it is that they're doing. So there's transcripts the same day within a couple of hours of the oral argument and we have the audio the same week on the Friday and I think that probably the compromise here is a practical one and that is that the court believes that they are making the audio available quickly but not quickly enough so that it'll make it onto the evening news the night of the oral argument. Why are they afraid of that? Afraid might be too strong. I do think they sincerely believe what Justice Scalia said and that is that What's going on in the oral argument is uh, to and fro on very complicated things and that there will be a tendency on the part of the media to pick out the things, particularly, you know, comments from Justice Scalia who can be hilarious and, you know, can really get in the face of lawyers sometimes that will be the, raise the most public interest but may not be the most informative. It's, it's an irony that the court so treasures the media and the press and the First Amendment but when it comes to what happens to them, they are more suspicious. How much of all this do you catalog or do you archive on your website? Well, we have all of the briefs and we don't, we don't try and do everything related to the Supreme Court. So there's a wonderful project called the Oyez Project that has done incredible work with the audio, archiving it, collecting it, matching it up with the transcript so that you can search it. And so we have a cooperative relationship with them where on Friday, they then post the audio on the blog. And who is Oye? Oye is a project formerly uh, done by a, a professor named Jerry Goldman at Chicago Kent that is another public service. Kent is Northwestern? Uh, no, it's at Chicago. At it's, Chicago. it's in Chicago. Uh, it's another university, and they have an entire project devoted to, they've now collected all, uh, very recently, they've gone all the way back, all the audio that's available over the decades from oral arguments to make them publicly available. And, you know, the justice's view about this is, look, the, the audio, oral argument audio isn't anything formally important at all. It's the decisions that matter. But what the OES project recognized, I think, was that it's still a part of the process. It's a fascinating insight. And I, I actually think they're right, because when you go to oral argument bef where the justices are asking questions before they've met together, you get the most unadulterated view of what that particular person thinks before they have to come together and agree on some kind of least common denominator uh, view. So how many people work for SCOTUS Block? It depends on how you count it. We've got about four full-time staff. We've got uh, another part-time staff of around 15 or 20 people. We have another 100 people who contribute during the year. It's gone from, you know, me and Amy sitting in the bedroom, you know, clicking away on a computer to a whole enterprise where the it probably cost us $5,000 the first year by Year seven, it was costing me a quarter million dollars a year out of pocket. Its budget now is a half million dollars a year. And, you know, money doesn't tell you a ton, except it gives you a sense of scale where we really are throwing a lot of resources at it. And what does Bloomberg Law have to do with it? Well, they're its savior. Uh, Bloomberg Law has, is unbelievably good to us. I think Bloomberg, decide, Bloomberg Law, which is a competitor of Lexis and Westlaw, uh, a fantastic legal research service, wants to use the opportunity to get its name out there. But on top of that, just thinks the blog is a public good, so it wants to support it. And they just let us do our thing. They think that it's you know, good to have a relationship with us, but they just want to be supportive. So they make everything possible in terms of the finances of it. They give us access to all of their online materials, and they give the public access to all the online materials that's linked from the blog, and they say, have at it. Is it a for-profit company? It is. It's not listed as a not-for-profit, but it has lost way more money than it will ever make. So how many lawyers are there in your law firm? Uh, in the law firm, there are about four lawyers, but uh, you know, one part-time, three full-time, and Amy, as I mentioned, is now really focused exclusively almost on the blog. Are you still cold calling? Uh, much less. That's the thing, is that as you get better known, uh, people tend to come to you. And so whereas before, I would say, in the beginning, nine out of the ten cases that I would do would be a situation where I went after the case. Now, 
one out of the ten. It's changed dramatically. But still, if I see an opportunity out there, for sure I'm going to go after it. But now, if someone has one of those cases where a court of appeals decides something and it could go to the Supreme Court because there's that disagreement, then they're going to get contacted by ten or fifteen lawyers in a way that ten years ago they would never have heard from anybody. Who's the best advocate you've ever seen before the Supreme Court, besides yourself? <laughs> well, I'm not even, I, I don't make the list. Uh, the two best, the three best that I've seen were John Roberts when he practiced, Paul Clement now, and Maureen Mahoney when she practiced, uh, a lawyer at Latham and Watkins. I would say in terms of standing up there and presenting from the private bar, and then the government has some unbelievable lawyers. There are the two deputy solicitor generals come to mind, in particular Michael Dreben, who does these criminal cases for the government, who just blows you away. And then there's a, another a deputy named Ed Needler. They're incredible lawyers. So you just learn so much from being around them. Is there more interruptions today than there was 20 years ago by the, by by, the justices? I mean, you can't even measure it. Every single justice who's joined the Supreme Court has asked more questions than the one before them for decades now. And so it's reached unsustainable proportions. I think the justices all recognize that, but they don't have a way, they have a, what political scientists call a collective action problem. They can't all agree on a way of dialing it back a lot. And Justice Thomas has spoken frankly about, it's one of the reasons he doesn't ask questions. He just thinks it's too much of a free-for-all and the lawyers don't get to say anything. I mean, our job is to go up there and answer their questions as best we can, but they, uh, you know, you can get, at, when you're getting asked four questions a minute, it's hard to tell something coherent. Did I hear you say on, on something I was listening to that the RNC impacted the way the court feels about releasing the tapes and all because of Don Varelli's activities during, who was the yeah. solicitor uh, General, for yeah. the government yeah. during Obamacare. Yeah, so what happened was everybody remembers the oral arguments when the administration was defending the statute. The Solicitor General, Don Varelli, was criticized for having, what happened is he had drunk a glass of water and aspirated it, went into his lungs, and so he had a very halting start. And so the RNC decided to make fun of that and immediately produced one of these web-only commercials that was never going to be on TV but got a lot of attention. And so the justices, I think, looked at that, in fact, I know, looked at that and said, this is exactly what we're concerned about, is the ability to take something out of context, use it to make fun, not take seriously, bring down the institution. It's a good illustration of their concern, and I think it's a valid point that it's a good illustration. So they, they set that cause back with that ad five or ten years easily. Here's another one and the final one of your videos uh -oh. from YouTube. <laughs> Um, finally, I recognize that some naysayers will say nay, that I concocted these events merely to draw attention to the television series that NBC is producing about my life and practice, which now has the working title, The Real Supreme Court Litigators of Washington, D.C. But that is not so. Hey, maybe you're perfect, but I'm just a human being. Every day, I wake up with just one goal, and that's to make the millions of other Americans who, like me, graduated from college with a not quite B average look good. And I think it's working. Yeah, 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 definitely. I, I think we nailed it. Those were your Bermuda shorts. They, well, I wasn't going to, nobody else had any available <laughs> like that. Uh, yeah, those, uh, you know, I think that if we can lower the bar to people thinking the Supreme Court is this inaccessible institution that's too complicated, that really isn't engaged with American life, and make them, I don't know if this succeeds, but you know, make them feel like they understand the place and it's not too foreign to them, we'll have accomplished something. So general public watching says, how do I get to all this? How yes. do I get to OYE? How do I get to scotusblog.com? Sure. Well, it's just the fantastic thing about the internet. It couldn't be easier if you put in, if you put in Supreme Court blogs, SCOTUS blog, my name, Oyez, uh, whatever search engine you're using will take you straight there. Uh, I got to do The Daily Show and, and John Stewart said, you know, SCOTUS blog, how do, how do people find it? And I said, the internet? Uh, it's, it's all very, very straightforward, thankfully. And once you get to the front, you'll be able to search for particular cases or see what the court has done this day or this week. They often cite John Stewart as one of the reasons why you'll never have television in the that's court. That's true. Wh I think that's the reason, probably, because why? Well, look, he is unbelievably, yeah, unbelievably funny, and he can cut like a dagger. 
and uses, he and his team use video very effectively. And the justices are incredibly serious people doing unbelievably important work. And, you know, that's not how he comes at it. Uh, he brings everybody down to earth and uh, uses it to the ends that he thinks are appropriate in, in you know, making fun often of big important institutions. And uh, having video of the justices at oral argument that he can slice and dice, I think, is something that they think would be, some, several of them they think would be awful. It, and they, th look, they've got a point to a point. The difficulty with that argument is that there are still the 95% of other times when people would look at that institution and see, gosh, they're taking this really, really seriously. Do you still get nervous when you stand in front of the court? I've never gotten nervous never. standing in front of the court. I'd probably be a better lawyer if I did, to be honest, and that is it might drive me to prepare even more, no matter how much time I put into it now. But this is the one place that I know. I came to understand it during law school. I decided this is what I wanted to be. And so standing up there in front of them is more home to me than almost anything else I do. So you, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, yes. undergraduate degree in what? Yes, political science, barely, but successfully. Somebody's watching this saying, I want to do what Tom Goldstein did. Yes. What's they the recommendation? Need, look, nobody should try and be me because being me isn't the, you know, cat's meow. They should really try and be whatever it is that they love, that they wake up in the morning and are so excited to have the chance to do. And for me, that's the Supreme Court, but it could be anything. If you're a lawyer, it could be immigration or patent or whatever. It could be being a doctor. It could be helping people in your community. It could be politics, whatever. That's how they'll be great. And I'm not saying that I'm great, but I'm as good as I can be because I couldn't be happier doing this. And they should not believe that because they didn't go to one of the top three schools in the country that that's the end and they'll never be at the top of their game. If you do what it is that you love, you can find something that you're the best in, in my opinion. We're going to put on the screen uh, a caricature or, or a drawing by Art Lean. Yes. Not of you, but Thank it's God. of the court. Uh, Art Lean, we've known for years, yes. NBC. Yes. NBC, uh, now Scotus Blog as well. Is he full-time Scotus Blog? No, or? he's basically, he principally works for NBC. So we have, he's a sketch artist. He's been covering the court for decades. And what I decided, Scotus Blog is a little bit boring visually. And that's in the nature of the Supreme Court. I don't have video. By the way, before we, uh, I just want everybody to know that yeah. that is, uh, is, uh, a caricature of an empty chair where Justice yes. Breyer would sit. <laughs> uh, because Justice Breyer was hurt, and that's yeah. what that's representing. So you have Justice Sotomayor, nobody, Justice Thomas, Justice Scalia, and you're seeing the edge of uh, the Chief Justice. Why do they allow this in the court? This has been going on since the 1800s, and I don't think they can put a stop to it. And I don't, they, they're not afraid of people seeing a sketch of the Supreme Court. I think that they're, that's not out of context. That happened. Uh, that doesn't have the downsides they want. And, and by the way, it's a little bit of an illustration, to, to use the phrase, of how it is that they are trying to do as much as they can without the camera. So moving up the audio and, of course, on super big oral argument days, they do the audio on the day. Take health care, take same-sex marriage. They'll do it right then so it is available the same day. Uh, or sketch artists and print publications and everything. They just haven't gotten over the hump with video. So you're a predictor from time to time. <laughs> if President Obama gets another yes. appointment to the Supreme Court, who would it be? Well, I think it would be Justice Ginsburg retiring, uh, would be the natural and logical person, but who knows what it is that she'll do uh, if you just say that was most likely. Uh, I think he'll definitely appoint another woman because going from three women on the court back to two would be unfortunate, I think, in the view of... Uh, a lot of people, including the president. And then, who knows, it'll depend. It won't be for a couple of years. I would say my leading candidate for it is the Attorney General of California, Kamala Harris. Tom Goldstein, lawyer, attorney before the Supreme Court, founder with his wife, Amy Howe, of scotusblog.com. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, call 7726 for free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.